The world's largest and smallest, richest and poorest countries make up the Commonwealth. 54 independent states working together towards shared goals. The Commonwealth celebrates Commonwealth Day every year on March 14th, designated since 1977 to promote understanding on global issues, international cooperation and members' work. In 2011, Commonwealth Day will celebrate women whose work has made a positive difference in the lives of others. In the past two decades, the role of women in Caribbean development has been changing significantly. In the 1970s, few female voices were heard. But in the 80s and 90s, women in the region gradually began to take their place in academia, politics, and the global movement for women. The Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago marks Commonwealth Day 2011 by sharing with three unique women who have transformed their lives and the lives of others. When I started doing this work um, with the Domestic Workers Union, I was about 27 years. Ida LeBlanc is General Secretary of the National Union for Domestic Workers, NUDE. A founding Caribbean Regional Coordinator for the International Domestic Workers Network, locally, Ida fights for the rights of domestic and other low-paid workers. I started this work um, following the footsteps of my mother, Clotel Walcott, deceased, in trying to help her because I saw her working so hard trying to do something for domestic workers in Trinidad and Tobago. So I felt that I had to assist my mother because she wasn't getting a, lo a lot of assistance at that time. So that is what um, had me um, helping. And then sometime in 1990, Selma James from the International Wages for Household Campaign sent for Clotel and I at an internet attend an international conference and there was my my life my whole life began the life of trying to focus on protection for domestic and all other low income workers who are primarily women Ida describes why domestic workers need representation in Trinidad and Tobago, we have the Industrial Relations Act, and under that act, they give a definition of who is a worker, and it's under that that domestic workers are specifically excluded as being a worker. Now, under the Minimum Wages Act, we have the Household Assistant Order, which make provisions for the domestic worker, and they are considered as worker under that act. So. This becomes very difficult for domestic workers because we are unable to bring cases of dismissal, wrongful dismissal of domestic workers to the level of the Ministry of Labor and also for recourse at the Industrial Court. Initially lacking confidence, Ida sought to educate herself about representing workers. After I attended the conference in Vienna in 1990 and I came back, I had was one of the things colloquial rules were that um, when you attend any conference, you must report back to your constituency here in Trinidad and Tobago. And a number of time in attending these um, meetings that she held, you know, I, I I ended up crying, speaking about the domestic workers, and I felt that it it was because I didn't have enough confidence in myself that I wasn't informed enough, so I started off now trying to educate myself so that I can better represent them by attending the Cipriani Labor College to do industrial relations and also um, I was able to participate in a number of international um, courses for example at Rutgers University in New Jersey I attended a women's leadership project there I in 2005 I was one of the 12 human rights advocate from around the world that were elected to be on a course at the Columbia University in New York. And I have been able also to attend several ILO courses at the International Labor Campus in Turin that educates workers, employers and government in, in, in relation to workplace issues. 
The job of General Secretary of NUDE is multifaceted. I have to take care of the day-to-day -day activities within the union and the general administration of the union to get it is operating properly and efficiently because we have to do everything like other unions. Every year the government appoints an auditor who has to um, check our books and records to ensure that we are following the rules of accounting principles. So all that I have to make sure that is in order and also I'm a grievance officer with the union because I um, take up grievance grievances with workers and I try to um, resolve this matter at the level first at the level of the employer by calling in the employer and trying to in an amicable way to resolve the matter and if it doesn't resolve at that level then I report it to the Minister of Labour and we get a voluntary conciliation at the Ministry of Labour and if it doesn't resolve there, well then we get a certificate, an unresolved certificate and it is now referred to the court, the industrial court, for determination. Ida and her team have had some success through lobbying. Domestic workers must be able to get recourse to the law like all other workers but the only how we can do that is with respect to violation of the minimum wages order and that is something that we have lobbied for and won and we were successful in that so that now wrongful dismissal under the um, minimum wages order can be carried to the court not to the civil court anymore we was able to get government to change the jurisdiction from the civil court to the industrial court so that it could that domestic workers could easily enjoy that kind of protection because in Trinidad and Tobago domestic workers are not allowed to get um, legal aid you know legal aid is is if a criminal um, did some kind of activity they will be able to go and get legal aid but domestic workers are unable to access legal aid in this country and that is one of the things that we are also lobbying to ensure that domestic workers um, be protected under this kind of legislation because there's a lot of money to hire a lawyer in Trinidad and Tobago and we don't get that assistance like for example in we have an organization the Domestic Workers United in New York City who we are affiliated with and they got lots of um, lawyers doing pro bono work for them and I tell them that that is non-existent in Trinidad and Tobago society Everyone say yes, domestic workers must get help, but nobody, um, nobody will put out a hand to help us. Although we have been knocking on lawyers' door, asking for help, we are never helped. The struggle of domestic and low-paid workers is an international one. In 2006, Ida joined her fellow activists to form the International Domestic Workers Network. We decided to start off with that international network and lobby um, the ILO to come up with protection for domestic workers. So I am one of the founding members of that um, international network and at present uh, I am the Caribbean coordinator. They have given me the mandate to come and um, try to um, organize domestic workers organization throughout the Caribbean. Now a member of the Minimum Wage Board in Trinidad and Tobago, Ida sees her role in this way. With the ILO convention and recommendation that we hope to get this year, we, our government will have to do more work with regards to the domestic workers. And I believe I will play a very important role there, being on the Minimum Wages Board to guide, advise, about domestic workers. Committed to the working poor, Ida is high in praise for the support of international agencies. We get most of our help from international agencies. For example, the Global Fund for Women. I must talk about them because they have helped us a lot to reach where we are today. And the IUF has given us a little assistance from time to time because of our involvement with the international network. We have recently gotten some finance from the UNIFEM, United Nations Fund for Women, and we get a technical assistance from the ILO. So 
with these support from these various international agencies we are able to continue with the work for our people here in Trinidad and Tobago. Feeling positive about the way forward, Ida says. But this new administration coming in, the first thing they did was to support the ILO Convention for Domestic Workers. And something like that, action like that, really make us feel in a positive mood. Because it's not only about talk, but it's about taking action for domestic workers. So I feel positive that in the long run, we will get protection for domestic workers and they will also, we will get them to be included under the definition of worker. I came out in 1999. Well, um, I was in there for murder and also robbery. Claudine Felix is now head of a new foundation called Woman Thou Art Loose. Committed to the transformation of former female prisoners, this organization is in its embryonic stages. At 22, Claudine was a single mother of two, pregnant and in prison. She shares glimpses of a 12-year incarceration and how she transformed her own life. To me, I had a good childhood coming up and I believe within a person, you know, people just want to say, um, maybe some parents can have a, um, a say, you know, but as I just tell people, I can't blame my parents because really and truly, they try their best to send me to school. They make sure I have clean sneakers, clean bodies, comb my hair, my belly full in the morning time. But when I reach out and I amongst the school girls and school boys, yes, there, was, there was a different clothing. And one of the things I remember reading the newspaper, and especially when you don't have a solid income, and you already have a trend to like badness. So I will read the newspaper and I will take out clippings and I will have a scrapbook. But my clippings will be different. My clippings will be always on bank robbery. Because the fact is that you don't go in a poor, you don't have a good educational background, and the real source is finance. So when you always, I always read about bank robbery. I will always watch about movies, you know, where robberies will take place. Because I don't, can't get no job. I don't have no experience. And at that time, it was not to say, well, I learned as much with my hands to say, well, I can do a business on my own if something like that. You know, you are your own outside as a young woman. So I ended up meeting one of the guys. And when I met him, you know, I said, well, yes, I, I, I read about you, you know, I read about you and all the things, you know. And as a woman, you know, they tell themselves, well, you know, I was not able to do certain things, you know, so... But anyhow, I get into the gang with them, and it's from that time, my life took a different, different rule. I started to do what wasn't right in the sight of the citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, and even in the sight of God. I started to do things that wasn't right. And end up with a murder case, end up with the robbery cases, end up on, in a female prison, 12 years away from my children, it was a little privilege that I had persons to take care of my three children. Released in 1999, Claudine was faced with the challenge of reintegrating and starting over. When I came out, nobody to receive me by the gate, but really and truly, it's just my mother and two other persons I told that I was coming out. It was tough first, because when I came out, I must come out with about $200. After 12 years, $200, and what that could I buy was only toiletries. And then you remember now, I come out, I don't have no qualification. The only thing I sat there, I do school even. So anyhow, when I came out now, no job, nobody really there to receive me, but I had a home. Because while I was there, my mother 
build a home. She built, she had uh, renovated, so I had a room there waiting for me, which was really, really good. But when we talk about the finance, really, even the finance, a big woman. I remember now I told a big woman, I have to look for that because they can't give me money every week. And I will go to social um, programs or social department that they say is to help, you know, especially ex-prisoners. And it was like always some kind of negative remarks and that kind of keep me from not going back to them. And then I meet women who had organizations to help women and I enroll myself in those organizations. They send us to do courses. That's how my life started when I leave prison. I just enroll in courses. Never up to now, never have a proper job. And sometimes I, I do work with URP and that's how I am living right now. I, 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 I stay a, a group to help female prisoners. I don't get a stipend. Still without a steady income, Claudine works daily to support women like herself to become independent and empowered. Well, this group now, because of what I face when I, you know, come out, they didn't have a, they didn't have a particular body to help female prisoners. Now, there is bodies outside there for the average man and woman. But when dealing with a person that comes from prison, we have to sit down and give you a whole history. I think they should have an organization set up for that. We already know you really some person, so we won't go into your business to have you feeling all how you need a job. We're going to know your skills, you're going to know your qualification, we're going to seek places for you. So, in all my struggle and in all the groups I have been, I decided, well, here what happened, Claudine. You had an experience, right? You know how it is as a woman to leave prison open an organization and then I was with Vision and Mission and they gave me a they gave me an idea and I saw what it is could be achieved by persons who coming out from prison, especially when you have a transformed mind. So I set myself to have an organization to help ex female prisoners and even to help female prisoners and we named the organization Woman That Was Lose Foundation. We carry the scripture Luke 1312. And our main objective is really to have a home for women. Not so much as a halfway house, but a home where that when they leave the prison and they don't want to go back into society, especially into the area that they come out from, they may be living in a crime area that will be fested with drugs, they may be, they might leave an abusive husband, they may leave a husband who never really help them, they may leave an apartment and will spend their time in prison when they come out, they have nowhere to stay. So we want to cater for those women. Sharing the benefit of her experiences, she also visits women in prison. Because of my experience and I was there and now I come back, I can tell them, hello, do you feel when you leave here? You're going out and meet a bed of roses, right? You have to stop your isms squeezing in prison and really, because you could get tied up in prison, they could get very comfortable. You understand? Even though there is days of hardship and frustration, but there is also days will make you feel comfortable and you could get carried away by that and say, well, there's nothing, man, outside nice. And when you reach outside there, yeah, Persons who come in to visit you now is because of sympathy. They have sympathy on you and you cannot help yourself, so they're going to come visit you. If it's your father, your mother, your brother, whosoever, they will bring whatsoever you need by the gate because you're not working in there to say yeah, you're going to have a salary to buy or purchase whatever you need, so they're going to bring it. But when you leave there and you go out, you have to stand on those feet. And then if you leave children out there and if you don't have no qualification, well, darling, you will end up go back or you will struggle so much that you might want to end up taking your life. Because I have known instances where people come out and they can't catch yourself and they try to take them their life. I have no women who come out and they can't catch yourself and they say, see me, I go back and send my drugs. And they go back straight into what takes them into prison. The only thing, they do it better. Now in her mid-50s, Claudine is undaunted. I feel that I am achieving my purpose, you know, and 
I feel that, you know, my person, because as I tell you, when I sit down or lie down, I reflect on my upbringing as a youth woman. I didn't have to do what I did. I didn't have to. So persons who may be here, you know, listening to me, don't feel you could go out there and, and, and commit crime and go in prison and feel, well, I will come out and I will do things. Not everybody, because um, things of prisoners come out and they go back into same crime life. Some of them ain't go back into crime life, but they live a normal citizen life. So it's up to the individual. Don't study, don't study the average persons. They may be getting a lot of things, you know, but you just keep in the world and God will take you straight through. The race is not really swiftest, but it's for those who endure. I was first inspired from a very ch small child as early as I could remember myself. Now an icon in the fashion industry, Heather Jones displayed her creative genius from an early age. With modest beginnings and an arduous journey, Heather tenaciously wove the fabric of her life to become a premier fashion designer in the global marketplace. On the age of seven, my mother was a seamstress. Um, she was a neighborhood seamstress, and my mother was the most creative woman I knew. And she even made costumes, costume jewelry, bags. So I grew up in a very creative environment as early as I could remember myself. From the age of seven, I understood how to put a dress together on a doll. And also, I pick up scraps under the machine. I'm always sewing. I'm always there with my mother looking at what she's doing. So that, I guess that was my earliest inspiration. I guess she was the beginning of my dreams. Keeping that passion alive, Heather captured the attention of her peers at secondary school. Going to school was another story because going to school, I draw all the time. I am always sewing. <laughs> Lunchtime, I'm always in the washroom with the girls fitting on some outfit. I'm always doing something in the line of beauty or fashion on a lunchtime. Her early influences came from her immediate environment. After I left school, I found myself on the drag on Independence Square. What attracted me to the drag is the creative energy I found there. Art always attracted me. Creative, the creative industry made me feel really happy and good about myself. And at that early age, I knew what direction I wanted to go in, so there's where it began for me. Seeking to develop her raw talent, Heather sought training from an expert. I went to Fitz Blackman on Independence Square, number 78 Independence Square. I can never forget that address. <laughs> Why I went to Fitz Blackman? Because I knew that he was a bespoke tailor in Port of Spain at the time. And I also knew that he sold for Dr. Eric Williams. And in my head, that I wanted to do, to create professionally made garments. I did not want the run of the mill seamstress clothes where you stitch a garment and it's royal on the inside. I wanted well done pieces. A young woman among tailors, she recalls an important lesson that made a lasting impact. One day I made a plaid jacket. I had to mount a plaid jacket and when I was finished putting the jacket together, press the jacket, it was on the hanger. He passed, and I press it right where he would pass on a lunch time so that he will observe it. And when he passed, he saw it, he said, who made this jacket? And I was so proud to see me because all the tailors were looking at it and saying how good it was. So when I was so proud to say it was me, and then he got very serious and he said, this is not good. Take it apart and put it back together. And you know, I was saying, but why me? Why, why is he doing this? But I put it back together and I hung it back up so that he would see it when he passed in. And when I caught his attention a few days after, he looked at me and he said, young lady, it's time to leave. Let this be 
a stepping stone. With little formal training and much enthusiasm, Heather Jones took her entrepreneurial spirit to Independence Square. We went to Independence Square and we had a table and a bench. There's where I started. We used to, I used to go to Najib or go to the tannery on the bit of estate and buy um, leather, strip it, make belts, produce belts, make baby sandals, make um, leather accessory like purse, bags, and there's where it started for me. And every day I will create something beautiful. But in the meantime, I continued to develop my art of sewing. So what it is I did, my school friends would still come visit me. I would make things for my friends, for women who I knew, people who I met. Anybody who would bring me a piece of fabric, I would be blessing them and welcoming them because I would be getting the opportunity to practice my art. And I did that for three years. I sold for anybody free. Free just to get the opportunity to work on different textures, different styles, for different body styles, and to develop my art. An important thread in the fabric of her life, Heather remembers her first clients. I remember I, I worked for this woman. She used to come in from Canada and bring all these beautiful fabrics in her suitcase. And this time, it, she brought silks and I never worked on silk chiffon before and, you know and it was expensive fabric and she said Heather you cut that fabric if the fabric spoil it is material we'll buy more and trust yourself you could do this man I trust you and I produced those garments for her and I remember after producing the garment for the lady the lady gave me four hundred dollars that was plenty money and she said don't you ever sew for me free again she said you are good your work is excellent and you're ready for the market another client of mine miss huggins i used to work for miss huggins all the time and this day miss huggins said to me heather when i go home in a garment it is, it is a holistic experience. She said, Had I have to give you this money. And she gave me $300. And she said, from this day on, I will pay you to make my garments. And, you know, and as, so now I begin to make a little money. So as fast as I make money, I'll go uptown to Jimmy Abud, pick up a piece of fabric and sew it. With simple fabrics and a lot of imagination, she created her first collection that launched her as a designer at age 23. I created this beautiful collection. It's still one of my most beautiful memory of my collections. And I hang all these things up in the boot and the drag and independence square. By that time I had a, a, a structure and independence square. And all these beautiful clothes in the boot at this day. This is Kitty Hannes. She, she worked at the Express. She passed and she saw my things. She went back to the Express. She called Peter Blood. She called Rosemary Stone. David Walcott. Uh, this guy. Keith Shepard. All of them. And they came down and when they saw these beautiful garments I was producing. And then I was like about 23 years old. And that was the launch of my career. Well, everyone knows who is Heather Jones now. People started coming to me. I started getting a lot of work. So now I have to work to save up to buy a good machine because I, all this I'm doing is on my mother little old machine that fell apart every five minutes. <laughs> From Independence Square, Heather took her designs to the local runway. My first show was at the Gulf City Auditorium. And my second show was at the Hilton Ballroom. There's where I met Jackie Kuno, my dear sister, friend. We're still very close friends. And Jackie taught me a lot. She prepared me actually for the real world, for the real fashion world in Trinidad and Tobago. She also prepared me for the international market. 
that gave me the confidence to go from one stage to another, you know. Building Hada Jones through the years was challenging. Embraced by another design mentor, she explored the international market. Janice Lawrence Clark came down from New York to speak and she spoke on fashion and different things. I attended the seminars and stuff and after that um, Janice saw my work and Janice said, you know something, I would like to, have you ever been to New York? And I said, no. She said, you should come to New York and meet with me and I will take you around to see the international market and to show you how other designers are doing it. And she said, your work is quite good and I'm sure if you attempt them, you know. So I decided to take up the challenge. In 1985, I ventured in onto the international market. First market place I did, I showed in New York at the Jacob Jarvis. And then I went on to show at Long Beach Convention Center at the, the at, uh, uh, trade show, a women's trade show there. There's where I met Lisa Adzo. And the first time they met me, they bought 11,000 US dollars in goods from me. <laughs> Returning to Trinidad in high spirits, Heather faced her first major business loss. And when I came home, there was nothing in my shop more than five bags of scraps, one machine, thread that fall out the bag that they took it in here and there. All the food in our fridge we were on Piccadilly Street at the time. By then I had moved from the Dragon Independence Square and gone to Piccadilly Street. Remember the good old IDC had moved me and put me into that building. And everything was gone. Everything. And that day I had one faithful worker. She came and she sat there with me. And my, I was shaking because we had a lot of up and down with the police and police coming and everything. And no one was ever caught. Huh? <laughs> and, the, and I would see the people that took my stuff, I would see them wearing my clothes right in front of me and watching me straight in my eyes. I lost everything. So that day I started, I said, Arlene, you know what? Tread up that machine. I said, any color tread, you find tread it up in any color. And I started pressing out my scraps. Real sad and really, really sad. And I press out, I start pressing out the scraps and we start stitching the scraps together. And we start making big pieces of fabric. By Thursday, at the end of that, by the Thursday of that week, we had 15 garments on the rack. Out of the scraps bag and lovely garments. Then came this woman from Atlanta who saw me some years ago, came to Trinidad and came looking for me and she found me. When she found me and she saw that scraps collection, she was like blown away. Oh my God, she bought every piece of the scraps collection and asked for more. Literally starting from scraps, she rebuilt her business and moved to downtown Port of Spain. It was 1990. We built the business. Five months after putting phones back in, cupboards, everything going good. Customers starting to come back to us because they realized we relocated and stuff. There came the coup, and the coup mash us up. It mash us up. We lose everything. With a firm resolve and backed by family and clients, Heather used her resourcefulness to recreate her company. I had to come home to my three-bedroom house, and that house had to be... That house was a convertible house. It was home in the night and it was a factory in the day, factory slash business place in the day. And all my clients followed me to 6th Street Barataria. Nobody left. More clients came. And we were there. We did that for 13 years. 
until we were able to reach to 55 Lewis Street, Woodbrook, where I am right now. Today, Heather Jones Designs is a successful international brand, but remains deeply rooted in a family-oriented environment. Known for her light, breezy, exquisitely painted creations, she continues to rivet the attention of fashion aficionados the world over. Honored in the fashion industry, Heather has also received the Chaconia Gold Medal for her contribution to the world of fashion. I share my experiences with other women to influence them, hoping that the courage, the passion, the love will inspire them to another level. Hoping too that the mistakes that I have made along my pathway, that they too will learn from my experiences. And also knowing that I always let them know that the only revenge it have in this life is success. I will always be pressing forward to another level, a higher level. I guess this is what I strive on, challenge. <laughs>